Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. We appreciate uh, you, you, uh, your attendance, and uh, we especially appreciate our, our witnesses. Ed Corrigan, Paul Teller, Rachel Bovard, and Mark Meadows, we're grateful that all of you would come and be with us today. And, uh, and so I want to just uh, also thank FreedomWorks for providing this space for us and uh, give kind of a, uh, a brief opening statement, uh, and then we'll go to, uh, to our witnesses. And you will see members coming in and out because there are any number of meetings going on uh, for whatever reason uh, on Congress today. So, <laughs> so it's happening. Uh, while votes are still being counted in a number of races across the country, it appears that the American people have given Republicans the opportunity, however marginally, to serve in the House Majority for the 118th Congress. And this week, we are tasked with determining how a House Republican majority will run, choosing our leaders and choosing the structure of our steering committee and the rules. And in January, we'll vote for the Speaker of the House and on the House rules for the 118th Congress. Each of these steps will have a major impact, impact on the House operates next Congress and how we fulfill the promises we made to our constituents during our campaigns. And today is an opportunity for us to discuss what might be the best way to rule and govern our Congress and our conference coming up. I believe that good process results more often in good policy than bad process does. And I hope that we'll be able to have a productive discussion and learn from the witnesses who are joining us today to share their expertise and their experience. Under current House rules, 430 of 435 members have no true opportunity to provide input into major legislation considered in the House of Representatives. Congress is the legislative branch, and we are elected by our constituents to be their voice in crafting, amending, and debating the policy of the nation. But the current autocratic leadership-driven process robs us, and more importantly, our constituents, of the ability to participate meaningfully in the legislative process. Over the past four years, Speaker Pelosi has used the rules of the House of Representatives to further centralize power in the hands of leadership. House Democrats have approved rules changes to give the Speaker same-day authority to pass legislation. They kicked Republicans off committees. They allowed proxy voting on the floor, virtual participation in hearings and markups, and installed magnetometers outside the House chamber, which are still in place at least as of this day. And while Republicans have rightly opposed the changes implemented by the Speaker, the consolidation of power in the hands of leadership is not a problem unique to a Democrat-led House. In fact, it was the Republican-led 115th Congress that set a record for the most bills considered in the House on the House floor with no amendments allowed. Good policy gives us, it comes downstream from good process. And this week we have the opportunity to improve process in the House of Representatives. Structural reforms to Republican conference rules and House rules are necessary to ensure that members are empowered and engaged in the legislative process and to ensure that we can rein in both government spending and unaccountable government agencies. We have tremendous witnesses today. Rachel Bovard is the Senior Director of Policy at the Conservative Partnership Institute. Ms. Bovard is responsible for CPI's training curriculum where she's led classes on house procedure for Hill staff and has written extensively on the rules. She previously served in senior legislative roles in both the House and Senate. Ed Corrigan is the President and CEO of CPI. Mr. Corrigan has more than 25 years of leadership experience on Capitol Hill and in the conservative movement. With his youthful appearance, you would say he must have started when he was 14. <laughs> Ten of those years were spent as Executive Director of the Senate Steering Committee, where he was a master of using rules and procedure to the advantage of conservatives. Paul Teller is the Executive Director of Advancing American Freedom, 
Mr. Teller was a longtime staffer of the Republican Study Committee under seven different chairmen. He chased them all out, apparently. Paul, is that what happened? I don't know. Ultimately, he has served as its executive director. He's a veteran of countless policy and procedural fights in the House, and we are grateful he's joining us today. And finally, my friend and mentor, Mark Meadows, set the example for all House members on how to use the rules. He's still feeling the smarts, uh, the smarting from some of that, I think. He made the, quote, motion to vacate, quote, famous. And he used the rules to maintain his position as subcommittee chair when House leadership tried to oust him from that position. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and all the members here. I'm sure that you all have ideas on how we can make the House function better so that we can all fulfill the promises we made to our constituents when they sent us here to represent them. And so today we're going to hear um, first from Ed Corrigan, then Paul Teller, then Rachel Bovard, and then Mark Meadows in that order. Each of you have five minutes um, to make your presentation, and Ed will go with you first. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Biggs and Mr. Gates, uh, for the opportunity. Um, my name is Ed Corrigan. I'm president of the Conservative Partnership Institute. I've been working in the legislative process for 30 years, 20 of them as a staffer in the United States Senate. Rachel and I teach classes in legislative strategy and procedures, and we often remark that it feels like we're teaching history. Congress has been so fundamentally broken for so long that many members don't even have any sense of what it might be like to be an empowered participant in the legislative process. Congress might be broken for the members, but it actually works very well for the swamp. It's a well-oiled machine that produces whatever the swamp desires and treats rank-and-file members like sheep. Member participation has been extinguished in favor of a centrally controlled process with few staff in the leadership offices making all decisions in secret. In light of the narrow majority, activist members of the House Freedom Caucus should recognize and embrace what we have today, which is de facto European-style coalition government. In a sense, we have three political parties in the House, the Democrats, the Republicans, and the Freedom Caucus. More than any time in history, the HFC has extraordinary power to negotiate a leadership arrangement that empowers all members, especially conservatives, and restores the deliberative house that existed for 200 years. The HFC should negotiate collectively with leadership for what it wants. Here are some of the issues. The most obvious example uh, of, of a problem is committee assignments. The current process is governed by a shadowy steering committee, which produces the fiction of a fair process, but is actually a rubber stamp to reward le regime loyalists. The steering committee is a useless hamster wheel and should be abolished. I recommend that the Freedom Caucus ignore the steering committee altogether and negotiate directly with the speaker for committee positions for Freedom Caucus members. Second, the in the current system, both political parties employ a pay-to-play scheme where members purchase seats on key committees by paying fees to political party committees. Committees that have jurisdiction over subject matter that is of interest to major corporations and financial interests command higher fees. This corrupt process should be banned. What would coalition government look like in practice? I would recommend that the Freedom Caucus be granted a specific number of committee assignments and full committee and subcommittee chairmanships. Specifically, HFC for, should ask for the chairman of the Rules Committee or at a minimum of three if not four seats on the committee. The rules should be changed to allow for any member to make a privileged motion to vacate on the, uh, the chair. This is a gesture of good faith by the speaker that he intends to do with what he says. All conference meetings should be restructured such that HFC members are guaranteed time to speak during the first half of the meeting. If this is going to be a true coalition, HFC should have the time on the agenda to do with what it wants. Bills should only put out on the floor if there's a consensus in the conference. I'm not talking about the theme week bills where the leadership pats conservatives on the head and sends a bunch of bills over to the wall into the Senate garbage can. I'm talking about the important bills, appropriations, NDAA, debt limit, budgets, reauthorization bills, must pass bills that are designed to be signed into law. We should not be putting bills on the floor that get more Democrat votes than Republican votes. You all sacrifice a lot to be here. You live out of suitcases and miss your family. There's no value proposition in doing that when the job becomes only voting yes or no on some bill written in secret that you don't care about. Being a congressman or a senator used to be fun. You got to write bills, offer amendments, and debate. Let's get back to that. 
Finally, the goal of party leadership should be to de-escalate tensions within the conference and to foster creativity and enthusiasm among, among rank and file members in the base. That, the way to do that is not autocratic control. The way to do that is by encouraging members to be active participants in the process. Thank you, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Corrigan. Mr. Teller. Thanks for having me today. My remarks are going to be far less exciting than that. <laughs> um, uh, great, great honor to be with you. Uh, you know, based, I, I guess I got invited here after my, my nearly 13 years on the Republican Study Committee, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Biggs, under seven chairmen, uh, and many, many of those years working to assertively push rules changes in uh, the conference and committees, particularly in the House at large. Always, though, in all cases, the work of House conservatives and the allies on the outside was always focused on empowering individual members and empowering conservative caucuses um, with a goal of advancing conservative public policy solutions, right? There's no point in changing the rules if it's not going to help bring conservative solutions uh, into, into light and then into law. Uh, as also, as you said, Mr. Biggs, since policy and legislation are downstream from rules and process, conservative policy wins cannot happen absent a rule structure that allows for conservative solutions to even be considered. Uh, at the organization of which I'm privileged to, be, privileged to be executive director, called Advancing American Freedom, we assembled what we call a freedom agenda, uh, a menu for advancing freedom in America, built by voices all over the conservative movement. So we're focused now on how do you activate that, that freedom agenda. If you're going to activate the freedom agenda uh, to send conservative policy solutions to President Biden's desk and ideally into law, the rules of the House need to be modernized, right? We can't keep living under what we have in the current House. Uh, I look forward to our discussion today, but I thought maybe I'd just highlight a few things, particularly from the House Freedom Caucus's uh, you know, booklet of proposals, which was fantastic. But a few things I just wanted to, to point out. Two in particular. One, I love how you're calling to bring all individual appropriations bills to the House floor before June 30th under tr truly fully open rules. Uh, ideally, no pre-printing requirement either. And again, this is all Washington speak. But basically, uh, you know, open rules on appropriations bills were standard practice for years, for decades. Uh, and Republicans harshly criticized Democrats when they reversed that, that precedent. So we should go back to that so that all kinds of amendments could be, um, could be offered. I also love how the Freedom Caucus is calling for the prohibition of legislation coming to the House floor unless there have been 72 actual clock hours or more. I think you may even have called for 120, but let's even, for the sake of argument, say 72 hours uh, uh, have actually transpired. Because again, if, if the bills are great, if we believe in them that we're putting forward, What's wrong with letting 72 hours pass so people can review it, think about what amendments could be, what a vote position might be, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then a third thing I wanted to point out, this wasn't, I don't think, in the um, Freedom Caucus booklet, but one thing that we've, we pushed for years at the Republican Study Committee did, didn't quite get there, but it would be fantastic if you eliminated the prohibition on authorizing on appropriations bills, right? Right now, you can't put authorizing legislation on appropriations bills on the House floor. And here's where it gets, you know, not so fun. They could do it and have been able to do it in the Appropriations Committee, but again, you can't do it on the House floor. So another way of looking at it is Democrats, who seemingly will be in the minority next year, on the Appropriations Committee can authorize on appropriations bills, but Republicans in the majority, presumably next Congress, won't be able to authorize on appropriations bills if the rules stay the same. So that's, that just seems unfair, unwise, uh, something you should look at. And again, it's a way of being able to get good conservative authorizing bills, legislation, onto the bills, as Ed was saying, that will pass, that are must pass, that will go to the president's desk. And then the last couple quick points. Um, any, I would advise that any rules changes that you do win from your, from your booklet, you know, make sure you really uh, get promises that they'll be not circumvented, that they'll be implemented, right? Um, we've, we've talked about this over the years in, at the Republican Study Committee. How do you define all of the things? For example, you know, uh, if you're looking at open rules for all individual appropriations bills by June 30th, well, what do you mean by individual appropriations bills? And is June 30th hard and fast? What if Congress is out of session? Where does that deadline move? In other words, look at the details, because that's what we found over the years, that sometimes the devil is, is in those details. And obviously, if you win, uh, you, know, you get rules changes, but then they're waived 
in the special rule for a given bill, or a bill, more bills come under suspension of the rules, uh, that seems to be not, uh, not serving its purpose either. If you're going to er, you know, earn some rules changes, they should actually you know, uh, be, be implemented and used. So anyway, look forward to our conversation today, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Teller. Ms. Board. Congressman Biggs and members of the Freedom Caucus, thank you for inviting me to participate. Uh, my name is Rachel Bovard, and I'm the Senior Director of Policy at the Conservative Partnership Institute. Since helping start CPI in 2017, I've built out programs and curriculums designed to train both members and staff on the rules, procedure, and culture of the House and the Senate. My curriculums are based on my own experience as a senior staffer in both the House and Senate, but I've also spent years learning from the three Capitol Hill legends sitting beside me, Mark Meadows, Paul Teller, and Ed Corrigan. But before we even begin to discuss the specifics of how House rules should change, it's important to ask, why does procedure even matter? In politics, aren't majorities the only thing that matters? The answer, of course, is that procedure, that is the rules that govern the House, are what make majorities matter. And at its core, procedure is what makes representation matter. The rules are how individual members of Congress are given the right to exercise their will on the body. It is the structure by which all voices are heard. But the House of Representatives in 2022 is as autocratic as it has ever been. Over the course of the last 15 years, the People's House has, has increasingly just reflected the whims of three or four people and no more. When I came to the House as a junior staffer in 2006, open rules on appropriations bills were the norm. Members would vote until the early hours of the morning on any and all issues individual members cared about. Fast forward to now, I've spent five years teaching staff who have never even seen an open rule. As I tell many of them, it's a unicorn, mythical, elusive, and exists only in books. <laughs> staff today have seen one process, usually giant bills written behind closed doors, dumped on the membership with little time to read the bill, much less amend it. They are bullied into voting for the bill and punished if they don't. The House, in other words, is broken for the members, but it works as intended for leadership, K Street, and special interests. So the discussion today must focus on reforming the rules to bring the representative element back to the House. To that end, rules reforms must democratize and empower individual members. Ending proxy voting and getting rid of the magnetometers on the House floor are baseline expectations. They aren't reforms, and they shouldn't be treated as such. And working groups, task forces, and listening sessions are nice, but they guarantee approximately nothing. To matter, rules reforms need to be structural. At a minimum, conservatives should demand representation on committees, including the Rules Committee, and then those committees should actually be able to work. Martial law, the idea that a giant bill can be dropped on the body and voted out the same day, should be abolished, and a two-thirds vote required to waive that should be a what should be a mandatory wait time for floor consideration. And importantly, the rules of the House should reflect the will of the political majority, not whatever deal a Republican speaker can cut with Democrats. To that end, no bill should be brought to the floor that doesn't have the support of the Republican majority. And Republicans on the Rules Committee should be bound to vote and consider amendments from their colleagues. However, none of this matters without an enforcement mechanism. The motion to vacate, bringing it back in its full form, will ensure the speaker has an incentive to honor his commitments. Thanks for including me, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Ms. Board. Ms. Ms. Well, I don't know what to call you. Uh, <laughs> Representative Meadows, Chief Meadows. Uh, uh, Mark is fine. Uh, <laughs> it's great to be with all of you. It, it's encouraging to me for there to be uh, a good representation of members here, because uh, it's not just Freedom Caucus members. It's a, a wide variety of people uh, representing uh, you know, across the country, and and as we look at at uh, two different sets of rules, one being what are the conference rules? Uh, all of you are are experts in how the conference actually works or doesn't work. I would suggest that uh, many times the conference uh, has a particular agenda. There's not really any debate that happens in conference. You will show up and you'll have, uh, at best, uh, a few minutes to express 
your opinion as a member of Congress at the very end of the conference uh, meeting. Uh, I would, and, unless things have changed uh, drastically over the last three or four years, that's how it was when I served. Uh, I would assume that it is similar to that uh, because there's not been any real uh, push to change the way that your conference works. And so uh, those rules that are attached to uh, conference initiative should be a place for open debate where uh, not not just one particular opinion is known, but the, the opinion of, of the entire uh, conference. And uh, I would encourage you to look at that very closely. Obviously, you'll be voting on those rules here within the the next uh, 48 hours, it, it appears. And, and as you look at those rules, one of the concerns that I have is, is when you do not empower individual members, essentially you are putting uh, a muzzle on 750,000 people that you all have the privilege and honor of representing. And so I would encourage you to look at that. More importantly, uh, than the conference rules, though, uh, would be the, the House rules that ultimately get voted on uh, once you're sworn into Congress. Uh, one of the very first official acts that you, you take uh, will be to vote on those rules for the House. Uh, Rachel mentioned it so well. Uh, it, it is almost at this point, uh, I've, I've heard more members of Congress say we need to return to regular order. And there are very few members, in fact, I'm looking uh, uh, at, there, there are none of you that have actually served in a Congress where regular order actually has taken place. Uh, now, does that necessarily mean that conservatives uh, or moderates are going to win the, win the day? It doesn't. Actually, it, it, it does exactly the opposite. It gives everyone a voice at the table. And the priority today, and the priority with the rules votes, needs to be the American people. You know, what we're talking about today and what's being covered today obviously is not something that gets talked about around a dining room table. In fact, most of what gets talked about uh, around a dining room table is who got elected, where was the red wave, who's going to run for Senate or governor the next time. But when you get into the, the nitty gritty of what actually controls Congress and the way that we go about uh, making things happen, it's not discussed. So it's up to all of you to actually not only be well informed, but be in a position to let your voice and the voice more importantly of your constituents to be heard. When we look at appropriations, many of you may go through appropriations. You prepare your amendment. I know I did when I was a freshman and sophomore. I, you know, I looked up and, and there was an, an amendment with my last name on it. Well, we voted all through the, the middle of the night. We, we had all of these. And, and for what? It absolutely didn't go anywhere. We actually passed a CR. Uh, we continue to pass funding bills that don't get amended by the very amendments that we allow. And so uh, it is critically important for us to change the process, not for any one particular group, but for the American people. Uh, they believe that special interest actually controls this town and, and they're right in one sense, but in another sense, they're wrong. It's four votes that control this, this town. It is the majority and minority leader of each particular uh, body of the House and Senate that controls it. You guys know it. You may not ever be, admit, uh, be able to admit it when a reporter asks you, but you know that when it really gets down to it, that most of the major decisions are made in a private room without your input. So how do we reform that? We go even further to make sure that the chairman and the subcommittee chair uh, men actually have some kind of response for their, their body of legislation. We pick people who actually know something about the subject matter and put them on committees based on that, not based on the amount of checks that they ha happen to write across the street. When we start to do that and we use their ability their experience, their tenacity, 
It's good for the American people. And so I look forward to, to answering your questions. You know, the shelf life of an ex-congressman is about six months. I'm way past my expiration day. But in doing that, I would be glad to offer whatever insight that I can. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Meadows. We're, we're glad to have all of our witnesses. And so I would remind the members as you go, five minutes. We have the clock over here so you can you can see it. Um, and we're going to start with the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Mr. Meadows tells us that four votes control this town. Well, depending on how some counting goes out in California, four, four votes may control the House of Representatives <laughs> and may be quite dispositive. And that four vote power might be substantially democratized. If the American people get one thing from this forum, it is that the broken rules of the House of Representatives are not a bug of the system. They are a feature of the system. We have built something that is purposefully mystified so that corrupt, bad decisions do not get exposed and so that members of Congress aren't held accountable when they vote for bad things. And there is a community of common fate that continues to allow that to persist. The principal critique that almost every member of Congress has about this place is that you get to a point where ultimately you feel like your vote doesn't matter. Your vote's controlled by the leadership. What is your one vote going to do? Well, now, with the opportunity we've been given with a very slim majority, everyone's vote matters to a far greater degree than at any other time during the public service of the people currently sitting on this dais. I will confess I'm not a member of the Freedom Caucus. I did not have a role in developing these rules. I don't agree with all of them. I am a proponent of proxy voting. I believe that sending the members out into their communities more often makes things harder for lobbyists. What if instead of just sitting at the Capitol Hill Club and buying people's votes and signatures on letter, a thousand, five thousand bucks at a time, these lobbyists actually had to get on regional jets and go to like northwest Arkansas and southern Mississippi and go lobby members of Congress? I think it would be terrific. Check out my essay in the Washington Examiner on that point. I, I would also observe that there are several things that I think we should actually work with Democrats on to change the rules. And let me outline some of those. I believe that no member of Congress, by House rule, should be allowed to accept a donation for their campaign from a federal lobbyist or a federal political action committee. That money all has strings attached to it, and anybody who tries to tell you otherwise is lying. And when members take hundreds of thousands of dollars from lobbyists and PACs, they work for them more than they work for their constituents. And guess what? I intend to offer that amendment on the House floor in January, and I already have Democrats ready to vote for it, maybe even all of them. The second thing I would suggest is that if someone is a member of Congress, they should be prohibited from lobbying for life. Why is it so hard to say that you should choose one side or the other to be on? You're either in the lawmaking game or you're in the influence peddling game. And those who choose to be in the influence peddling game, go ahead, but you should sacrifice that when you get the privilege to represent 750,000 people. I intend to offer that amendment on January 3rd, and I expect that there will be Democrats voting for it. I will also introduce an amendment to have a ban on members of Congress trading individual stocks. How can we say that that is not something that dilutes our trust in markets and in governance when people are essentially able to bet on the outcomes that they have an ability to somewhat control? Uh, and I expect Democrats to vote for that. And finally, I would observe something that has really worked well in the state of Florida, a single subject rule. A bill coming to the floor should only deal with one subject. I was incensed as a freshman when I had to vote on the farm bill and whether or not to authorize war in Yemen in the same vote. And we could still have broad bills that relate to insurance or education or appropriations, but the notion that we lash all these things together does not serve our constituents and the American people. And I would expect, if we're in the majority, Democrats will vote for my amendment for a single subject rule. There is a vote, as Mr. Meadows said, coming up in the next 48 hours regarding conference rules. Here's what I would say about that. It doesn't matter a lick, because once we get to the floor, coalitions will be dynamic and volatile, and I can't wait to swim in those turbulent waters. My question would be to Mr. Meadows, is it treacherous and deceitful for conservatives to team up with liberals to achieve some of these reforms that would liberate our institution from the corrupt grip of lobbyists and special interests? Well, Congressman Gates, obviously those amendments that you mentioned that you would put forth uh, would get great bipartisan support. Uh, and, and that's part of the scary uh, aspect for some in leadership is they don't want that because they know that it would pass. 
as you know, Congressman, uh, when we served together, there were a number of times where uh, something was not put on the House floor because they knew it would pass. And uh, those uh, items that you mentioned uh, would, would pass. But under the current rules, let me, let me just be clear with the American people. Under the current rules, and probably the rules that get passed, you will not be allowed to offer those amendments on January 4th. Well, if Kevin McCarthy can call Democrats for votes for the speakership, I can call them for these bipartisan refor reforms that not only are popular among the membership, they're popular among our fellow Americans, most importantly. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Florida. I recognize the gentleman from Upper Peninsula, Michigan, Mr. Bergman. Well, th thanks, Andy, and uh, thank you all. And, uh, you know, with the redistricting, um, I can now proudly say I represent almost half the state of Michigan. So think about how far you can drive in ten and a half hours. That's one end of my district to the other. But it is uh, representing all of the people, both in the Upper Peninsula and the Northern Lower, because they sent me here. But they didn't send me here to come home every weekend and tell them what I'm going to do next week. They sent me here. Now, I'm a Marine. I'm pretty simple. I swore an oath a long, long time ago, and that oath never expires. And that oath basically said, I'm going to go wherever I am sent to do what I need to do to defend our country's interests and the interests of others. And that doesn't mean going there Monday through Friday and then coming home on the weekends, because the war fight does not stop on Friday at 5. So the point is, we were sent here, all 435 of us. Some of us have the luxury to sleep in our own bed, in our own home every night because of the district we represent. That's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. And some of us have to take two flights and then a two or three hour drive to just get into our, our own bed in our own home. So I believe the success of the 118th Congress, this is not Democrat or Republican, is having all of those members here for longer periods of productive time that enable the committees to do at a nice, um, not a frenetic pace, but a, but a pace where the dialogue can occur. I mean, if I was going to have one rule, I'd say, you know what, committee time, you get five minutes? Hell, change it to three. Let's start by saving 60% of the time, because I've heard so many much BS in that first four minutes and 30 seconds, and then the last 30 seconds you ask a question. So the point is, we, we largely, when you think about life, is always a competition for resources. It's been that way since the beginning of any, not even before mankind. If there's, if there's a carcass to be shared, it's going to be fought over so somebody can eat. Well, time and money. We know we have some financial problems. We know we are outspending our resources. We know we have to get that, begin to get that under control and bend that curve. But what concerns me most is time. A moment wasted is a moment lost. The one thing that God gave us all that is the same for everybody is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Not eight days, and that's not the Beatles song, okay? But if you can't get it done in 24, I would suggest to you break it down by the minute. There's 1,440 minutes in every day. And if you can't get it done in 1,440 minutes, there's 84,600 seconds in every day. Break it down by the second. My chosen careers prior to, to elected office meant breaking it down literally by the second. I know the American people want that for us. I don't know of anybody who gets elected here who's not trying to do the right thing for the right reason. But we have to be here. We have to, again, whatever we define regular order is, as Mark said, most of us don't know what it means. But we know when things are getting done and when they're not. And our constituents know when things are getting done and they're not. And I came here to more listen than talk. But the idea, I don't want to waste your time, so I'm going to yield back a minute. Thank you. I want to thank you for your service then and now. Always an honor and occasionally a pleasure. <laughs> thank you, General. <laughs> and thanks for yielding back a minute, doggone it. Appreciate that. Now we're going to go to the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Sparts. 
Well, thank you so much, and thank you, Congressman Bix, for organizing that. And I'm glad we he we have a broad range of people, group of people, and I'm. Uh, willing to collaborate with a variety of people who really care about this institution and care about democratizing this institution. As a former state senator, honestly, I was shocked <laughs> when I first came in Congress. I'm like, oh, MG, what a show. It's a theater. And what I'm doing my here. So I think it's extremely important to have that debate and deliberation. I have, this is how the greatest ideas are born. That's how we can serve the American people. And I think American people accept for us. And I think we have an opportunity to discuss it as an institution, what we can do to make sure that this institution is going to be a great institution it's supposed to be, but it is not right now. I'll be honest with you. And it's very disappointing for me and for the American people. So what I would like to do, you know, and I, when I actually was a state senator, we did some rules changing. I understand that we democratized our Senate before we elected pro tem. And we require, pro if, if you know, if there is a, a will of caucus and uh, people vote to bring something to the floor, regardless of what committee chairs feel, regardless of what pro tem feel, it had to go to the floor. We passed some major, great legislation in the state of Indiana. So what I would like briefly to ask you, you know, if you would say, you know, you know the rules here much more deeply than I do, uh, then what you briefly say, top three rules that would be very powerful and important for us to be able to agree on, you know, that would make our institution more, you know, deliberative body and more democratic. So I, I don't know if, if you can be quickly, each of you said, Ed, what, what would you say? Or we can start with Rachel since she had microphone. Okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think the top three rules, I think, were mentioned almost by all of us as one of the number one would be the reinst reinstating the majority of the majority rule. Nothing comes to the House floor unless it receives a vote from the majority of Republicans. Um, this prevents a lot of what a, a, a lot of us saw as a misuse of the institution under the Boehner years, which was, you know, bringing bills to the floor and passing them with Democratic votes. Okay. Um, so I think that would be number one. Uh, number two, I've seen a proposal, uh, I believe in the HFC book, talking about how amendments that receive at least 10% of support from the conference receive a vote. One of the biggest problems I see going to the theme of my opening remarks, which is simply that, again, procedure is what makes representation matter. If members are not allowed to represent their constituents via amendment, via simply receiving a vote, no one's saying that amendment has to pass, but the ability to actually have that vote, I think, is extremely important. Um, and then ending the, the practice of martial law. Uh, I think it's absurd and offensive, frankly, that these bills are written, giant bills are written behind closed doors with the input of a handful of lobbyists uh, and leadership staff and then dropped on the membership. You should all be offended by that. It's an insult, I think, to the, the positions that you hold and the voters you represent. Yeah, I had open town halls, and I told my people, you know, that we actually can, a speaker can just move everything, whatever he or she wants, on the floor, without committee, without deliberation, without debate, without looking, and without having any amendments to it, to it. People were shocked. I'll be honest with you. On a bipartisan basis, people were shocked to hear that it actually exists in Congress and it has to be fixed. Thank you. Okay, Paul? So and uh, really just a repeat of, of the three I mentioned earlier. I think maybe even before you got here, but, but super quick. So, you know, open, open rules on all appropriate bills, broken up into smaller pieces, brought to the House floor before June 30th, no preprinting requirement, just open, boom. Um, second thing, a true 72-hour clock rule, you know, for, before any bill can come to the floor. Uh, and the third is um, allowing authorizing on appropriations bills on the House floor. All three, I think, are designed to empower individual members, especially conservative caucuses, to bring flourish, uh, to have the conservative ideas and individual ideas flourish, get, uh, get their time on, uh, on the House floor, and then ideally land on the President's desk. Ed? Yeah, uh, so it was talked about, uh, obviously, um, more open rules on the, on the floor makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, I think uh, one thing that, that is an underutilized sort of uh, a, a thing that, that from the past is conference committees. Uh, right now, we do a lot of ping ponging back and forth, and, and they just have a, uh, a you know kind of these these deals hatched in secret. I think having a more uh, robust process where you have an open process on the floor where people can offer any amendments you want, and then basically have a real conference process where you can resolve some of those differences. I think that t takes some of the pressure off the floor process and allows more participation without threatening um, to derail the bill. Uh, I think I think that you, I would offer that you might consider. 
abolishing the four party committees, uh, the NRC, the uh, DCCC, all all those committees that that really um, end up as as like shakedown operations and 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 somehow have a relationship with with committee selection process. I don't really see, think that they serve a, a purpose in our democratic society, and I would abolish them. Um, and then I think, you know, one thing to, to think about is really more, uh, uh, you know, coming from the Senate perspective, uh, more collaboration with the Senate. Um, obviously, the, the Senate has its own problems. It used to be much more open. We used to joke as Senate staffers that we were worried about the Senate becoming the House. Um, and then the Senate became worse than the House. And now the House is, uh, is I think, both, both chambers need to open up. But I would encourage you all to use your voice uh, to encourage that on the okay. other side. Uh, it looks like my time has expired. But maybe if it, maybe I could borrow half a 10 seconds from. Yeah, Mr. Meadows, you, you, you can Let me answer. jump in real quickly. Uh, Congresswoman, you. what you've pointed out is the biggest surprise to members who come here who have served in their legislative body in every single state in this union. They look at it and they say, well, at least we had a process that we may not have agreed with, but we understood and it actually worked. Here, we, we have essentially taken uh, members who actually had authority in their state legislatures, and then we bring them here and all, all it is is, is where we're going to get together and hopefully vote on something that we have no input on. And so I, I would strongly uh, encourage you to consider some of the things that have been mentioned. In addition to that, uh, let's quit appropriating for things that are not authorized. You know, the State Department hasn't been authorized uh, in, in more than a decade, and yet so we, as Congress, as the people's house have not set their priorities and we continue to fund it over and over again and even if that's bringing a radical idea would be to take the appropriations so it's a little bit opposite of what Paul Teller is talking about bring the appropriations process and actually have an appropriations subcommittee in each one of your authorizing committees you break it all up so when they're talking about priorities and funding they go hand in glove Congresswoman, right now, people will vote for the NDAA and vote against the funding. They get to go home and say that they voted for the troops and yet voted the opposite way uh, when it comes to funding. And so we somehow have to, to bring those together. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll yield uh, five minutes to the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Harshberger, and then Mr. Higgins, you'll be on deck. Thank you for letting me go ahead of you, Clay. Um, Andy, thanks for this. And Victoria invited me. I know you didn't know I was coming, but you know, hey, I'm, well, and I'm not Freedom Caucus, but you know what? The, everything you said makes so much sense to me. I've never been in government until last, uh, the 117th Congress. Not a lick of this makes sense to me that we've gone through for two years. I try to understand it because I'm a factual type person. And I want to know, I want to do my due diligence on everything. You're talking about committees should have people on them who have experience in those things. What? That, that's just common sense to me. You know, Mark Twain said at best, common sense is not common. I mean, it's in dang short supply up here. <laughs> Regular rules, I don't even know if I know what that means, Andy. You know, is there... Regular I wish that they had trained us much better on legislation. I never was in, you know... In politics at all it's just I'm using my business sense as a pharmacist and as running a business and I'm like this how do we get to where we need to be when you were talking Rachel everything you said made a whole lot of sense to me I don't know that I've heard that before uh, and I did write down the top three rules you know the and the reason I'm here this is like Jack it's a listening session for me because my constituents are emailing and calling and asking me questions I can't answer right now and I'm like, you know, I need the facts. I can make a decision. It's not that hard. And, and they may, I don't know, but this is not rocket science up here. It really isn't. You know, it's not a calculus problem. You've got to break it down to simple math, simple addition. And that's the way I, I do things, and that's the way I present it to the people I serve. Um, are you going to give us notes on what you've said? Because I need them. I mean, really, that's good. And... You know, all I came to find out was, why are we voting on a rules package after we vote on leadership? I guess that was the biggest question. Maybe you can answer that. Oh, you shouldn't. I mean, so okay. I, I'll, I'll take, I'll take uh, uh, Mr. Biggs off the hook. You shouldn't. 
and and literally when you start to look at the rules package you have to understand because let me just tell you if you pass the right rules the speaker the majority leader all of those actually they come alongside that and embrace it and it doesn't matter near as much right now you know when you look at the the leaders of individual majorities whether it's in the senate or the house they have so much power that if you ha allow the rules to continue to be as they are, uh, it, it's, it's troublesome. So I'll give you one little fact. At 6 a.m. this morning, you had snow in your district. Uh, I drove through there. Uh, I drove yes, through there did. on the way here to D.C. You've got, you serve a lovely part of the, the country. Oh, of. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it's the best part of, of Tennessee. I've got the Great Smoky Mountains. I tell people my district goes from Bristol Motor Speedway to Dollywood. What else do you want? <laughs> So, yeah, it is pretty. How did you know that, Mark? You did drive through there? Yeah, I, I drove so. through this morning. Okay, very good. Rachel, I think you wanted to address that. Yeah, if I can just make one comment um, about what you're saying. You know, I think when when members and and even voters think about process, I've, I've been reading all of this sort of very dramatic press coverage, right, about everything that's going on right now and about presenting the rules debate as a power struggle, as this or that, you know, when we think about procedure, it's often cast that way, right? It is about power, and people think about it as a, a prohibitive device. But at the end of the day, I would encourage you all to think about the rules as simply a facilitating device. The rules are supposed to empower and empower you to represent your voters as best as possible. There's a, a book uh, put out by the American Academy of Parliamentarians. I'm calling all nerds, right, for anyone who's read this book. But it's, and it doesn't deal with the bodies, uh, the rules of the bodies, but it deals with the practice of parliamentary procedure in general. And in the beginning, it talks about the fact that procedure should not be used to baffle and confuse. It is designed to open the process. It is designed to make sure every single member of Congress who was sent here by their voters is able to present those views to the body. It doesn't mean you win, and it doesn't mean you're supposed to win or rig the outcome, but it does demand the right to be heard. So as you go into these negotiations, when we think about procedure in that way, it becomes very obvious when people are using it to push a certain outcome. The last thing I'll say is we see this all the time. Why are you considering a spending bill at the end of December? We know why. It's not because anyone didn't have time to write it. It's not because anyone doesn't know what they want it to say. It's because there's an abuse of the calendar, an abuse of the process to shut down as much dissent as possible. So when we start to think about it that way, rules reforms become actually quite important. Thank, thank you, Ms. Harshberger. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins. I thank my colleague, Representative Biggs, and I appreciate my uh, conservative colleagues for assembling here today. And Ms. Dana, you should, you should definitely join the Freedom Caucus. I encourage you to. So we're here to, to, to discuss rules in Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution. It says each house may determine the rules of its proceedings. And that uh, opening statement of the second paragraph of Section 5 of Article 1 has been used historically to justify the creation of some of the most absurd and injurious rules that the nation has had to in, endure. And I would argue that there's a difference between a comma and a period and a semicolon and a full colon, but hey, who am I? I'm just a guy from Louisiana. Let me just say that the rest of that statement goes on to say after a comma, each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, comma, not period, punish its members for disorderly behavior, comma, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, comma, expel a member. The entire statement is regarding the behavior of members of Congress. But the first portion of that statement has been used historically to say, oh, Congress can make any rules that they want to. It's in the Constitution. But it is in the Constitution if you leave out the rest of the statement. So we have, as a nation, gotten to a point where the, the American people are stunned when they find out, for instance, that we have suspension votes. They say, what the hell is that? We have to vote so all the rules are suspended, 
and you have like eight people on the floor, nine of them staff, that pass a, a, a bill. One, this year, I stopped a bill. Freedom Caucus was calling for recorded votes on all suspension bills. And boy, we faded a lot of heat about that. But we slowed down a Democrat agenda machine by doing exactly that. We stopped the suspension bill. It happened to be my turn on the floor. It had to do with nuclear armament being passed under suspension. You remember? They pulled it when they saw we were going to have a recorded vote. So the American people, when we reveal just what kind of rules have been coming to be accepted as the norm, this is the status quo, this is the way it's done, son, sit down and shut up. This is the way things roll here. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. So I'm going to jump because I'd like my colleague Mark to to respond regarding appropriations bills. We have 12 appropriations committees. You have 12 appropriations bills. They should be completed and presented to the floor in 12, for 12 appropriations votes. This would allow every member to vote reflective of our core principles. And may I say that when we abandon the core principles that gave birth to the document that we've sworn an oath to support, then we betray our duty to reflect those core principles in a representative republic. And if we, can, if we can have 12 appropriations bills presented in the appropriations season before the end of June, during every Congress, during every year, then we have, and we have 12 appropriation votes, by God, we can address the problems that, uh, that, that our nation suffers from, and I yield to my friend and colleague, Mark Meadows. What's your opinion on that, sir? Well, not only should we have the timeline there, but, but what we ought to do is empower our subcommittee chairmen. If he, listen, you can serve on the Appropriations Committee, and, and half of those appropriators know from day one that the work that they're doing is absolutely meaningless because they know that history shows them that they've never been able to pass that. And so to the, the point of not only having it there, whether it's you representing Louisiana or Tennessee or Michigan or Indiana, Arizona, Florida or Texas, those needs are very different and you will have different needs. And, and so the answer that appropriators have come up with, well, let's just bring back earmarks. Well, let me have a novel concept. Why don't we control the spending of the entire budget, not just 1% of it? Yeah. And when we look at that, then a priority, uh, it, gives, uh, it gives the general there the ability to actually go out and get a coalition of people together, whether it's in Louisiana or, or, or Tennessee or in between, and actually put forth that. So I, I think that not only does it do that, but it starts to return the process to where Congress uh, Congresswoman Sparks was talking about. It actually brings it back where it starts to be a legislative body where you have real debate. I came to Congress as a business guy. I mean, I was so naive. I came here. I said, well, all you got to do is find somebody who uh, thinks one way and another one that thinks the other way, get them in a room, make some compromises, and voila. Well, it is. But it's all about the staffers of just a few super members not of 435 members where that actually takes place. And so it's key that you do it. I think if you fix the appropriations process, a lot of the other, uh, you know, um, bills and legislative initiatives can follow suit and, and, uh, and hopefully be restored to regular order and we'll, we'll know it when we see it because uh, uh, with the, maybe with the one exception of the gentleman from Texas, no one has ever seen regular order. I thank my colleague, Mark, and I yield. Thank, thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Paul. He's, he's, he's bringing the mic for you. Um, the, the activity that I think we're trying to do today is to talk about ideas. Is that right? Yeah. That's correct, sir. And, and the ideas that we've got, just like when we talk about changing the rules of engagement with whether, you know, how we do our budgeting process, I think should be an advantage um, to the American people. I think the people should come out with something that's better. And uh, we seemingly, 
I seemingly think that a majority should decide what that is. Well, we haven't been in the majority for four years, and we didn't agree with that, so that's way with that theory that that was good for the American people. But I think that, that we need to think about it, that power of Article One, Section 7 also should be there for us, and that we need to think about what the House of Representatives, as members of Congress of this body, House, notwithstanding we have to work with the Senate, what's in our best interest? What's in the American people's best interest? And I think every time we win back the majority is because there was a, a real problem on the other side, like they ran away with everybody's checkbook and, and ruin the, are ruining the country. And so we've got to pull it back now. So I just think that the rules of whatever we do must be consistent with that. Now, Paul will tell you it's hard to get that lined up. Um, So I think it should deal with the stability of the majority. Paul may not agree with that <laughs> because I've been the chairman of the Rules Committee for six years and we were trying to give our team the stability, the stability to make hard votes, and then we found that they were compromised in the leadership. So I don't know that the rules were the problem the rules were the problem to the people that didn't like the decisions that were made, in my opinion. And that in going through this process, we need to make sure that the stability of the majority is there and somehow hold the leadership accountable. And that goes to the rules package two, vacating the chair. And so I just think that there's a lot to think about of what we're really trying to accomplish and who would accomplish it. And remembering this, that uh, I didn't, didn't study this before I walked in here, but our friends, the Democrats, had some bit of if any bill has 218 votes, uh, any bill has 218 members that support it, uh, as co-sponsors, they'll bring that bill to the floor. You know, that sounds real nice until you really look at it. And it could be uh, 217, Democrat, 217 Democrats and one Republican, and all of a sudden that wasn't what you wanted. I don't know that it's 218. It could be 212 Democrats and 10 Republicans. So all I'm saying is we just got to think about what we're doing, but it's always there. I always thought about it this way, that when we wrote the rules package, it was to create a majority that had not just advantage but could accomplish what needed to be done. And then all it takes is one majority leader to say we won't do a, a bill on uh, the border. <laughs> and all of a sudden it didn't matter what the rules were. That got gutted real fast. So, uh, you may have. Yeah. I just thank y'all both, all, all four of you, for being here. But that's the way I see it that you've got to make sure that it is about stability and not about empowering uh, a minority. I didn't even ask a question. It, <laughs> are you? Are you yielding, or do you have a question? I'll, I'll, I'll yield, but I, Mark, may I, you may have some comment about what I said. Paul certainly thinks things about what I said. <laughs> Y'all want to talk me out of what, yeah, I, what yeah, I'm 13 thinking? seconds, Mr. Yeah, 13 Miller. seconds. Any, Paul? Uh, I, no, I, well, I, I, time has expired. How about this? I'll just say, I, I do like what you, you, know you said about the stability. I'm, I'm, no, the stability, though, I think, make, makes sense where there is some continuity so that, you know, it's not, there's not such drastic changes where the American people don't know at any given day or any given year, right, what, what, rule, what set of rules are, are being followed. And, and frankly, even just I, I love this, this education forum because hopefully it is showing, uh, you know, Joe Citizen, you know, perhaps watching at home that the rules do matter because if you want to get good policy, and this is the perspective I've always come from, you want to get good policy, you have to have a good process first because if the process shuts down, 
your ability to get good policy, well, okay, then you're, you know, all the things you're promising and that you're voted for, just that you were elected for, aren't going to happen. So. Yeah, and then not all the things are in the rules. The day that the Democrats uh, pounded us and uh. caused, caused the whole House to shut down, uh, the Speaker shut off the TV to where we don't have any of it and they failed to see it. So, But that's not in the rules package. So, so there's a whole lot of decision making. So my, my good friend from Texas, is, his time has now expired. I get that one. <laughs> I, will, I will make one comment. But this I'll is a news you, flash you. to everybody. All of America believes that Congress is broken, so it's time to fix it. Yeah. And if we don't fix it now, when are we going to do it? Yeah, I appreciate that. And I just I was going to mention, uh, Mr. Sessions, that you were the chairman of the Rules Committee when I came in. And you were always cordial and gracious and let me offer my amendments, which were always declared out of order. But I was so grateful, <laughs> grateful to, to, to have such a cordial gentleman. Well, that says Ken Buck didn't agree with you. Because <laughs> I put Ken Buck on the committee That's true, for that you did. specific reason. Yeah. But you're right. I allowed uh, the, the then minority leader, Nancy Pelosi, three and a half hours uh, to come speak to the rules committee, and uh, it was uh, quite a, uh, a, t a task. So, th thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Sessions. And now I recognize the gentlelady from Arizona, who is also a former member of the rules committee. My friend uh, Debbie Lesko for five minutes. Thank you, Andy, and thank you all of you. Um, I agree with you, Mark. This place is a mess. Um, for those of us that served in the state legislature, we're used to a balanced budget. We're used to offering amendments on the floor. We were used to debating bills and amendments on the floor. And uh, I, I get so frustrated that nothing gets done here. So when you come from somebody like me or Andy or maybe the rest of you who are chairman of committees, in the state legislatures, and we got all kinds of great stuff done in a fairly, if not one term, two terms. Here, it is so frustrating, and um, I think we need to, uh, assuming we're in the majority, we need to get new rules in place, uh, new rules that will uh, help give more um, authority to individual members, and I, I think that is what the American people want. I'm yielding. She's, she's yielding. She's, she's, she's yielding back. I'm almost speechless. <laughs> <laughs> but I thank you. Um, and some others have indicated they're on their way. Um, they better hurry. That's all I can say. In June, the House Freedom Caucus released a package of proposals to reform House rules and Republican conference rules. And the package is focused on empowering rank and file members to increase their ability to participate in the legislative process, both in committees and on the House floor. Proposed reforms include adding the one, one thing that you've talked about, several of you've talked about, is a majority of majority rule requirement that bills considered on the floor are, are open for amendments, a restoration of the Holman Rule, and the elimination of earmarks. I want to ask um, Ed if you can tell me, are you familiar with the Holman Rule? Tell us what that is and what impact it is. And the last time we had it was in the 115th uh, Congress, which was um, four years ago. Yeah, um, as I understand it, the Holman Rule is an ability to uh, to have a vote on the floor to uh, address a particular uh, 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 bureaucrat that uh, folks are uh, un unhappy with um, and, and allow to, to have a vote on, on whether to uh, defund that, uh, that person. Um, I think it would be wonderful to bring that back. I think that the, the, the idea is to, to provide opportunities for members to have a voice and not to have unelected bureaucrats making decisions that are completely unaccountable uh, you know, to the American people. So I, I also want to address the single subject rule. In Arizona, we have single subject rule. And I think most states do um, have a single subject rule. And ostensibly, I thought that we did. But we've reached the point where uh, we might as well just throw every bill into one big bill 
and let everybody just have one bill, one vote, and be done with the whole thing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, you have 15 minutes and be done with it. When I first got here, Mia Love introduced legislation to really clarify what a, uh, a single subject rule would look like. And I've, I introduced it after she departed. Tell me, uh, Rachel, what would a single subject rule that had meaning look like and what would its benefits be? When Congressman Gates mentioned a single subject rule, my first thought was that it would literally grind this entire town to a halt because every lobbyist would be out of work. Um, they couldn't, <laughs> because right now, right, you know, the, there's a, going back to this idea that, that procedure and, and the way the House rules right now work as intended for a specific group of people in Washington. There's a, there's a very, the, the industry of Washington, D.C. has no problem with the way Congress currently functions. It works for them. It does not work for the representative body. It does not work for the people that sent you here, and it does not, I would argue, work for individual members of Congress. So to have a single subject rule, I think, requires that there's means of enforcement. It's one thing to say it. It's one thing to put it in your rules. It's another thing for members to be able to um, make you wield a point of order with it. It's another thing for members to be able to, if necessary, make a motion to divide or several to remove portions of the bill they feel do not belong there. Because these provisions, you know, arguably should be voted on, but they should be voted on separately. You know, one thing uh, Congressman Higgins, I think, made uh, this point very eloquently, and a number of you have as well, rules and the way they're structured now are designed to reduce the amount of votes that you have to take, right? Because votes create accountability. Um, the Senate has this problem in spades. <laughs> and I would hope, you know, that the People's House leads the way here in saying, no, 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 votes are what matters. And to this extent that procedure can facilitate those votes, I think that would be very important. Um, and one thing, if there is a little bit of extra time, I think, to, to Congressman Sessions' point, um, about making sure there is stability in how the rules function. One thing that I think is a very important part of this conversation is dealing with some of these uh, structural elements in the conference before you even get to the House floor. And I know that's something Ed's thought a lot about, and I'm going to push him in front of traffic and ask him to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> okay. So, please, Ed, keep it short because I have another question, please. Yeah, uh, really, really quickly um, on that, I, I do think that, that the more you have robust debate uh, behind closed doors and, and in the conference, the more you allow members that the participation there. That doesn't always have to play out on the floor. I think the single subject rule could be a, a way of actually facilitating a more open process because you could, you could constrain amendments. This doesn't have to be done on every bill. You could have, uh, and, and, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Sessions has done rules that, that are sort of along the lines of a single subject kind of rule, I think the goal would be to have a, a, a more open amendment process that's constrained by germaneness, um, but basically allowing for that to, to facilitate a more, a more uh, f uh, fruitful debate. So, and, and thank you for that. And I just say that um, I don't understand the notion that um, having more votes would limit the number of bills, because I'm okay with that, because it would, it would cause uh, uh, basically a natural selection of bills. And so the, the crappiest bills hopefully would, would uh, never see the light of day. That's, by the way, that's what the founders said. They said it's to mit our process is meant to be complex enough to act as a sieve so the worst ideas stay behind the sieve and only the best ideas get out in my time's expired. But I gotta ask this question. So, so and, and it deals with something that, that I think is so important. Establishing a new process for selection of committee chairman. This reform was actually proposed by both Congressman Jim Jordan and Congressman Mike Gallagher in the 116th. And what it is is to allow an, the members of a committee to determine who their chair would be. I think that's an incredibly important reform that would, would actually be awesome to have. We might actually get somebody who who is actually totally skilled in the subject matter of that, that committee. Mr. Meadows, you got the mic. Yeah, I think not only should you do that, it's long overdue. Uh, listen, uh, the steering committee, and y'all have talked a little bit about the steering committee, it's a mirage, guys. 
And, and anybody who has any of these reporters who will ask them uh, candidly, off the record, d is it a mirage? They will agree that it's a mirage because what we do is we establish who who the chairmen are going to be, who's going to populate, uh, who are who are the members that are going to populate the A, the B, the C committees. I mean, it, but it's it's supposedly all done behind the curtain like the Great Wizard of Oz, and and we all know that it's one person behind the curtain. And, and so here's what I would encourage you to, to look at. Not only let them populate it, but let, let them uh, essentially control their committee. A novel idea. If you've got a committee that deals with agriculture, let, let those that come from agricultural districts populate the committee, let them choose the chairman. But that's not the way that it's worked. That may be asking too much. But let me just say, the American people start to, to see it. I am encouraged by the group of members that are here because they each have a, a sphere of influence where they can start to make it. And maybe it's not this Congress where it gets changed, uh, Mr. Chairman, but it, it will change if the American people start to look at the way that we do business and say that, you know, when you start showing transparency, and saying, well, uh, you're from an ag district, so we're going to put you on uh, Ed and Workforce. I mean, and, and we do that. You know, we, we all know the committees that get doled out to people that are going to be a problem or the people that have less influence. We, we see those. And that's not to diminish the work of those individual committees. But if we're all honest, we know. We've got blue birds, red birds, yellow birds, we, you know, just like you did in elementary school. You have it here. The only difference is they have a committee name attached to it. So I think it's important that we do that. And as we do that, we start to return the people's house back to its rightful owner, which is we the people. Well, with that, uh, I really appreciate um, our witnesses being here to testify today. Great information. I hope that those who came to listen and those who came to debate, and people like me who just have a lot to say, <laughs> we're all benefited by, the, by this uh, forum that we had today. Thank you so much. Thanks for the members of Congress for coming. Again, thanks to Freedom Works. Uh, thanks for uh, the, the various networks that were live streaming this, and we appreciate that. And with that, we are adjourned.